Hello, and welcome back to the History Argument. Today, we are going to be discussing life in a trench during World War I. I'm the Brigadier General. And I'm the Raven Raven. Okay, so first up, we'd like to discuss day-to-day -day life in the trenches, which included rats, stale food, lice, trench foot, flooding, mud, and death. So we're going to explain these a little more, starting with rats. Rats prowled the trenches, some the size of cats. They fed on the dead bodies of fallen comrades and the f scraps of food left in their knapsacks. So why don't you go over stale food? Yes, yeah, so the food that the soldiers had in the trenches was stale, obviously very old because it had to be shipped oftentimes from a very long way away. Uh, we're talking canned food. Um, so spam was very common, um, uh, and that sorts of uh, almost meat products. Uh, you also had some rum in the trenches that were, would often be given out to the troops to sort of work up their courage as it was if they were going over the top, um, which is uh, go leaving the trench for an attack. Now, fresh water... Um, was available in the trenches. However, in most trenches, it was not that you did not have running water. So oftentimes it would be carried around in large uh, jugs and barrels throughout the trenches. So oftentimes, some, sometimes water could get uh, contaminated or infected and spread disease. Uh, and uh, going on to lice, lice were a huge problem in many trenches. Um, they would be everywhere. They would get everywhere into the bedding, if you were lucky enough to have bedding, um, into your uniforms and your clothes, uh, and uh, all, generally all over the place. And they, they were also transported by the rats, which were, uh, as already discussed, everywhere. And it made life in the trenches really horrific on a day-to-day -day level, as the, the difficulties that the soldiers were already facing on top of the constant annoyance of lice and rats. Uh, running throughout the trenches. Yeah, and so a big problem was flooding and the mud in the trenches, and these things would cause trench foot, which really, it, if you look up pictures, it's a horrific uh, swelling of the foot due to the flooding and mud that they stood in for hours and hours on end waiting for an attack. And one of the things that we did not include in this slide but was a big problem, was the uh, sleep deprivation that soldiers faced during their time in the trenches. They were constantly being bombarded, or the, the enemy would use psychological attacks on the troops in the opposing trenches to try and weaken them prior to attacks and just break down their morale. And so getting a good night's sleep was all but impossible in the trenches. That's very true, and uh, with the artillery on both sides, uh, keeping everyone awake, oftentimes when you did get sleep, it would be for very long anyway. As generally in the lower ranks, someone would have to be keeping watch in case of a sneak attack or something were to happen, uh, which was sometimes an even worse job because keeping watch in a trench, as soon as anybody on either side saw movement, you had snipers on the other side that would go and shoot. Now, sometimes people would deliberately put their hands out of trenches and such to get what it was considered a million dollar wound or go home wound. So it would ruin your hand so you couldn't shoot, but that's not fatal, so it could get you home. Um, and often, as these were only one or two man watches, um, uh, you had a lot of troops uh, that would do this out of sheer fear because the, what they were living in was worse than any other time in human history. Um, uh, quite literally, um, hell on earth is you're sitting in this trench, uh, unable to sleep, um, unable to get any rest, with the constant fear of uh, attack or bombardment, um, and artillery shells going off almost constantly. Um, it was unbearable. Uh, added on to that, you had the diseases that would go through trenches, uh, like trench foot, um, which, uh, as already discussed, it caused swelling of the foot, but it would also cause the death of the skin. So you would, your feet would literally be rotting while you were standing and walking on them. 
um, and troops did not have dry changes of socks or boots. So it would it only compounded the problem until um, sometimes feet had to be amputated and some people died. Yes, and so our final bullet point here is death. Uh, you had to constantly contend with the death of comrades while in a trench. Sometimes they would bury them in the sides of the trenches as a hope that they would help hold up the sides from bombardment or rain. And uh, it was a horrible stench was just across no man's land as futile charges in the machine gun fire would leave hundreds of men rotting in no man's land with no one there to retrieve their bodies. And so now we're going to go on to our next slide, which is about gas. And gas was probably one of the most horrifying things that soldiers would have to face in the trenches. And um, there were three main types of gas used. Uh, mainly mustard gas was used. And mustard gas would scar your lungs and would cause long-term lung damage, causing you to be short of breath for the rest of your life. And this effect many, affected many soldiers after the war that were in the trenches. And then there's chlorine gas, which is uh, far more deadly than mustard gas and caused a fast death and would terrify soldiers if they saw its signature yellow haze traveling across no man's land toward their lines. And then there was phosgene gas, which was more deadly than chlorine gas and was harder to see. And so it could be upon you and you could be breathing it and you wouldn't even know it until you dropped dead. And they trained, especially trained dogs to sniff out the gas and alert soldiers by barking so that they could put on their charcoal filtered uh, gas masks to defend against gas attacks and prepare to uh, defend against a possible attack from the enemy the uh, gas attacks usually happened prior to massive charges across no man's land. Hmm. Yes, now gas attacks were first used by the Germans uh, uh, early in the war as a way to scare and um, try to find a breakout victory. Um, but oftentimes, as it was gas, it was hard to control. It was slow moving and subject to the wind. So sometimes, when a side released gas, the wind could change and blow it back towards them, causing a lot of problems and confusion in general. Now, one of the horrific effects, especially found by mustard gas, um, uh, was that it not only uh, damaged your lungs, but it could also uh, melt your face and some limbs and such. Um, and so this would lead to the first experiments with plastic surgery, as uh, some British surgeons would go to the uh, lines and bring back soldiers who had been really scarred by uh, the gas and they would uh, use early methods of plastic surgery to attempt to uh, repair the faces of these soldiers. Yes, and um, another important part of the war and the life of a trench soldier was going over the top. This refers to literally jumping into no man's land over the top of your trench into the line of fire of enemy soldiers, their machine guns. And uh, there were four main things that you would have to uh, fight to get to the enemy trenches. The, the tactic of over the top was you jump over your trench, run across no man's land as fast as you can, and dive into an enemy trench to conduct hand-to-hand -hand combat with the people in that trench. And so uh, machine guns cut down many soldiers and barbed wire would be laid to slow their progress and essentially give the machine guns more time to slaughter them. And then artillery barrages would just smash into no man's land, sending limbs and dead soldiers spraying everywhere. And at night, uh, the uh, soldiers would lay mines so that if anybody came across no man's land, they might set off this explosive and th it would kill them and alert the people in the trench that there is an attack. And all four of these things resulted in massive death and destruction uh, throughout the entire war. Yes, now speaking of mines, uh, 
the Royal Engineers and other uh, groups in the British military used this tactic uh, most extensively. Uh, they would dig uh, tunnels called saps over uh, to attempt to get under the German trenches and uh, listen into what is going on and eventually to fill it with uh, explosives and literally blow the entire German trench up from the bottom. Um, now, this was um, very effective, um, uh, not only as, as a weapon to uh, destroy large amounts of a line, but also to um, as a psychological weapon, as um, you don't know what's going on beneath you. Um, and, however, it was too difficult to be really widely used and didn't have a large effect on the war. Um, now, going over the top, as previously stated, it was very made more difficult because of all the barbed wire mines that were strewn across no man's land. Oftentimes, you would have these group, these wire cutters sneaking across, attempting to cut through wires in, in, in the night and right before an attack. And they could not do much because there was just so much barbed wire concentrated across the battlefield that it was really impossible. It's like wading through brush, except the brush is made of metal. And it's it's barbed and and with, with razors on it. Um, so uh, many troops would often get stuck in the barbed wire and then be mown down by machine gun and enemy fire. Um, just to illustrate how uh, well the cost of going over the top is um, at the first day of the uh, Somme offensive, um, the British had f five, fifty seven thousand casualties in one day. It was the single worst day for the British Army. Um, uh, and that's one day going over the top and 50,000 men are taken out of the act, 57,000 men are taken out of the action um, all at once. Um, and you would see this across the world, these large numbers of soldiers getting out of their trenches, attempting to charge the enemy to make progress, to make a breakthrough. And most of the time, they, they would not gain an inch and thousands upon thousands would die. Yeah, so our final slide is going to be German trenches versus Allied trenches. And I understand that we have a little bit of a disagreement here, as you believe that they were mainly equal in their uh, preparations and uh, their, their lifestyle in these trenches. And I disagree. I believe that German trenches were far more superior partly because they had a whole entire different uh, mindset of warfare. The Germans were very much fighting a, a defensive war. Their trenches were built as long-term defensive fortifications so that they could hold against the onslaught of Allied troops, while the Allies were fighting an aggressive war, trying to make progress into German territory. So they had to keep moving forward. The Germans could afford to sit there and deplete their numbers. Another perk was that the German trenches had wooden floors, whereas the Allies were just walking around in mud, or at best on singular boards laid down on top of the mud. And in some cases, German trenches had running water and electricity. This, this was rare, however, it, it still happened across the front line that they had these um, special commodities. Yes. Now, I have to take you up on your first point there, is that the Germans were designed for defensive warfare. That's just a fallacy. Um, the Allies first started building trenches with the uh, French, uh, building trenches to defend their land from the Germans and the Germans who were attacking. The whole idea of the Schlieffen Plan was it was mobile, and they would punch through to Paris, take France out of the war, and then focus on Russia. And when the British joined, they also built trenches in Belgium, um, uh, and we have to look at what was the purpose of these trenches. Now, the purpose of these trenches was because a mobile war could not be fought because of the size and number of artillery that were being used, uh, amongst some other weapons, including machine guns, is being out in the open. It was nearly impossible for a soldier to survive. So it's much easier when you are beneath the ground, in the ground, so you cannot be easily picked off by artillery barrages and uh, other, uh, opposite troops. So 
you had this race to the sea with the trenches, but the Germans were fighting a defensive war in the second half of the World War I, but not in the early stages. They were, they were trying to be as mobile as they possibly could. So the idea that the Germans were built to outlast the Allies or something is, is just patently false. Uh, yeah. Well, I was specifically talking about uh, examples such as the Somme Offensive. It was, it, that was not a defensive attack. That was them trying to break through. The Germans were beginning to fight a defensive war after that first after they eventually realized that the Schlieffen plan was a lost cause and that they needed to just uh, try and limit their losses until the Allies could be brought to terms. Well, okay, then let's look at the Somme then. So the Somme, the, both sides were dug in at that point. The Germans weren't building like some sort of new, specially defensive trench here. They were operating on the same trench system that they had. Uh, there was increased need when they were preparing for the offenses, but um, just because they were on the defensive doesn't mean that they had some defensive advantage uh, or any more than you would have, because defenders oftentimes did have an advantage in, in, when it came to trench warfare. At, by nature, they were not the ones above ground charging in the face of machine gun fire. They were the ones with the machine guns in the trench. Um, but I, I, I do agree with you on uh, the one issue, which was the electricity and running water. The Germans, um, in some cases, and it was rare, and the Allies did have this as well, um, not so much the French, but the British, um, did have electricity in many of the trenches, not, not a lot, but um, closer to the Germans than what the French had. Now, the running water was very important. The German trenches did have this, and this was a large advantage because it meant that they had better access to clean water, which um, was helpful in, in many ways for um, uh, the uh, medics and, and those, those groups uh, needing to clean wounds and such, as well as just for drinking water. If, if you have better access to drinking water, it, it uh, helps your troops immensely. Um, and oftentimes the, the, the Germans did a better job with that, but I don't think that makes their trenches any better, as this was very rare. Um, in general, trench warfare was a couple of boards on the bottom, and you are sitting amongst sandbags, dirt, and mud, and that's about it. Um, if you're lucky, you're an officer who has his own quarters built into the back of the trench, but for most cases, you're sleeping out in the open in, the, in that trench, um, and that was the same on both sides. Uh, and if we're talking about trench building prowess, um, we have to talk about the Royal Corps of Engineers because they were absolutely and undisput undisputedly um, the best at digging cr trenches quickly and efficiently. Now, the problem with this was um, the, the, it's not a good comparison to the German army or the French army. Um, or any of the armies in World War I, because the British, while they had a small army, it was professionally trained. So they had an advantage, at least earlier in the war, while they still had the professionally trained army alive, because we have to keep in mind the scale of casualties. Um, the professionally trained army effectively died out almost completely by 1916, but the trenches they built um, were there. So I, I don't see a large difference between the German trenches and the Allied trenches as a whole. I don't think it can be really argued that one was largely superior over the other. Um, in some rare cases, certainly some trenches were better than others, absolutely. But I don't think we can make a blanket statement about which one is better. Yeah, trench is a trench is a trench. So um, that is going to wrap up this podcast. Thank you for joining us. And this has been the History Argument. Thank you.